We're very pleased tonight to have in attendance members of the uh, Cummins Engine Foundation, T. Randall Tucker, uh, Richard Stoner, Dick Joseph, and Mr. and Mrs. Miller. The reason why we requested Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Stoner to meet with us is to explain the architectural policy of the foundation, not only for the benefit of the three new members, but as a review to the older board members and to the community. We are uh, very concerned with the need for additional space in the Taylorsville School. Um, we just recently appointed a committee of three administrators, three teachers, and three parents to uh, study the three alternatives for the Taylorsville School. We can add to the present structure. We can add to the newer part of the structure and tear down the old part, or we can build a new school on the rear acreage and then tear down, as after completion, tear down the total structure as, as it is stands. So, uh, can we ask uh, Mr. Stoner to explain uh, the policy? Mr. Miller, I'm sorry. Would you take a seat here, sir? Sir, could I uh, introduce the board members to you? Yes. Are you familiar with them? This is Robert Frankie, uh, uh, Edmund Darlitz, Dr. Abel, Dr. Vickers, Alan Burbank, Gerald Perry, and I'm Chase Wilson. Well, we're delighted to be with you tonight and. Uh, I think that each time the school board has asked us to come, we've made it clear at the beginning that this is a, not a program that we urge ourselves. It's one that's available. And uh, the final judgment always, whether you accept it or not, is at the board, because they have the responsibility for providing quality education in the community and deciding how to do that. Uh, as far as Cummins is concerned, of uh, their enormous amount of claims on its contributions, both in this city and others. And uh, uh, we'll put the money to uh, good use, maybe here or somewhere else. But uh, I just wanted to make that explanation to the start, because uh, if I describe our interest in the program and why we think it's worth offering, I wouldn't want you to think I'm trying to sell anything, because that's just one uh, point of view of one group of citizens. I think from our point of view, it's better to start back a little bit and say, uh, why do we think it's a good thing to do at all? Over the past 20 years, we have put two and a quarter million dollars in this. We're a publicly owned concern, and it if you take two and a quarter million dollars of shareholders' money and put it in a school system, you better have very good reasons for that. Now, uh, our reasons goes back to our basic objects as a company. We compete on a worldwide basis nowadays with very formidable competitors, the best in the world. And uh, our headquarters is here in Columbus. Um, the only way you compete is not with dollars. If you do that, General Motors would beat you every time. You compete with people. And uh, we are able to compete very successfully and to have the kind of a growth that we get simply because of the quality of people that we have in the company. And as we grow, we have a great struggle to find more and more competent management. And we search the world over for these. Now, the kind of people that we are looking for are the kind that everybody in every corporation is looking for. And the first thing you run up against is that these people can choose where to live and work uh, because everybody wants them. These are highly motivated, usually younger couples with children. And the, the one consideration that always comes up as we try to build a company and its management team is quality of education in the city. The big question is, if I move to Columbus, will my 
children have access to as high a quality of education to prepare them for life as they could get in any other community in the nation or any of the other places where we have a chance to work. And uh, that explains the basic reason for our interest, and it's a very strong one in the school system. If we're to remain and keep our headquarters in Columbus, it has to be in a community that, among other things, offers as fine education as you can find for young families, because we can't hold and recruit a management team over a period of years if Columbus is not, in all respects, an outstanding community, and especially so in, 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 uh, in respect to education. Now, another uh, interest that we have, we're a taxpayer in this community. And as a matter of fact, we are paying an increasing share of the taxes. Uh, in 1965, Cummins paid 23% of the taxes. And uh, in 1972, it paid 31% of the taxes. And in 1973, it'll pay more than that when the Willsburg plant comes on. So not only do we pay a substantial amount of money out in taxes, but we are paying an increasing share, and the other tax holders are paying a decreasing share. So we have a concern about taxes. It is a big item in our bill. And as we have studied the problem now for more than 20 years, we have found the single biggest item affecting uh, the cost of government and taxes turns out to be inflation, as you probably well know. Uh, over the last 20 years, the cost of building a, the same structure has approximately tripled in 20 years. And it's interesting to see how that, how these construction costs are growing. The average rate of increase in building construction for the past 20 years is 5% per year. For the last 10 years, it's 6.9% a year. For the last five years, it's 9.9% a year. And last year, it went up 17% in one year. So the cost of delay is becoming increasingly expensive. Uh, any study of the last 25 years will say that the way to lower taxes is to build it sooner and to build it bigger. Every time. There isn't a structure that we built as a company, or we've seen the city build, that our taxes wouldn't be lower if we built it a little sooner and built it a little bigger. Uh, almost all of the facilities that were left out would now cost twice as much. Our technical center that was built only in 1964 would be almost out of reach for the company now. It cost $35 a square foot then. The same building would cost over $100 a square foot now. So, uh, as a taxpayer, we are interested in an aggressive school building program that meets the needs promptly, meets them fully, and meets them in a way that will last. Uh, clearly the best building that's ever been built in this town is the county courthouse. If you can imagine this tiny population over 100 years ago having the nerve to build a building big enough to serve this community for 100 years. That is probably the most adventurous, far-sighted investment that this community ever made. And we are all the beneficiaries of the fact that they thought big and they planned for 100 years, and not just for something that would last in their lifetime. We would have probably spent 10 times as much for five courthouses if they'd only built a courthouse big enough just to serve their own needs. It's, there are not many counties in the state that can point to a population that far side. So, uh, as taxpayers also, we are interested, therefore, not in the total amount of taxes paid, but in the fact, are we getting our money's worth for the dollar? That is what counts. And that means, does it really provide the services? Does it provide them at the necessary quality? And is it at a fair cost? 
So you'll find in your work that uh, if you're keeping ahead of the problem, Cummins will support you. And we'll speak on your behalf because we think this is a way to serve the community well and to keep taxes down over the long period of time. Now, uh, so I interested in school buildings, apart from this factor of inflation and cost. Well, buildings are only part of a top-notch school system, and we know that. The curriculum, the administration, and above all, the teachers are what really makes a school. But a teacher can be uh, impeded by a school building that won't work, or it can be helped by surroundings that to really make learning a pleasure and an excitement for a kid. Because the experience that a child gets in his first days at school affects his whole attitude toward learning the rest of his life. And if to him that has been an exciting and pleasant experience, then he is more apt to be a learner as long as he lives. We think that uh, outstanding facilities, we've heard, helps to attract the best teachers and make Columbus a preferred place to come to. And it certainly helps the industries in Columbus attract the kind of management that they they want. So it was with this background in mind that we laid out the program. Now, Dick has some copies of the, I think one of the first letters that we wrote about 12 years ago. And I thought I'd just take you through a couple of pages of it because in a sense, in essence, this is what the program still is. We start at the bottom. The program which comes off this is we'll turn to the third page uh, of your version, Jackson. Okay. Yeah, I can get a little start. All right. We we'll start at the bottom here of this one. The proposal is to contribute to the school board the amount of the architect's fee on each new building provided one that the architect selected for each new building be one not previously chosen. We thought it was better to have many solutions rather than just the benefit of, of one month. Second, we thought that the best buildings will come from placing at the disposal of the school board and the school administration the very best minds in building that there are in the country. So the second item was that the architect be selected by the school board from a panel of at least six first-ranked American architects prepared and submitted by a disinterested panel. And new lists have been submitted each time. Now, we, we proposed that for this reason, that we wanted to remove ourselves completely from any decisions. Uh, we do not take we think it's important that the whole responsibility be in the hands of the school board. So we have never named an architect to this list. We picked two people who uh, are senior architects who named the panel. We have never interviewed them. We have never looked at plans. We've never looked at proposals. The selection of the architect is entirely up to the school board and Cummins neither knows who they will be nor talks to them. And we think this is important to emphasize that the sole, that the total responsibility remains with the board. Uh, third, the architect ought to have the responsibility for a total design. And that is designing the building, recommending landscape, locating on the site, and recommending all interior furnishings so that the building, uh, as it finally is determined on by the board, the administration, and the architect, serves the total needs of the children. Uh, third, the architect, or number four, the architect should have the responsibility for designing outside areas as part of the total concept under the Park School Cooperative Plan. Item number five, Ex additions to existing buildings be designed by the architect who designed the original building. The fee for this handled in the normal manner, not covered by these. 
Mm -hmm. Item number six, the architect be required by the board, as would normally be the case, to work within the total budget determined and agreed upon by the board. I think that over the period of years of this program, the school board and administration have performed absolutely outstanding. They have worked very aggressively with architects to make sure that the building A served a purpose and B came within the budget. And my experience in building and working with architects is that the client is equally responsible with the architect for a good building. And it's hard to have a good building unless each of them work very hard and uh, uh, are totally frank with each other. And this board, I think, has had an outstanding record of uh, being a, a model client, and that is working aggressively with the architect to, to uh, hold a purpose and stay within the budget. And in that sense, it's better than most any board that I know of. It's been a very constructive relationship. Item number seven, I think, is a very important one, and that is architect chosen should be chosen sufficiently in advance to give him a period of at least 12 months' time within which to plan, design, and make working drawings. The real way to make mistakes in a building, in our experience, is to rush the planning and the conceptual stage. Uh, it doesn't cost very much to tear up a sheet of paper and make a new design and do it over. It costs an awful lot to tear down a wall or alter a building if it isn't right. So I couldn't no matter whether you accept this program or some other, I would urge you as a person that's built over a good many years, never short circuit the planning time. Always take plenty of time to do that, bearing in mind that you can make changes then that you can't make later. Uh, item number eight, uh, that they exercise a standard AIA contract Item number nine, I think, has now been changed because the AIA uh, reimbursement for expenses and the fee schedule has been raised since 1961. And uh, our recommendation is that they be paid on, uh, and our contribution program is based on paying them on the current uh, authorized rates, which all architects charge. Uh, on this final page, back in 1961, it said that our feeling was that such a plan would not increase the costs of new buildings, might reduce them. I believe the actual results over 20 years have been that these buildings have come in about on the average of Indiana school buildings on an adjusted square foot or a pupil basis. There have been some variations, some have been relatively inexpensive and some expensive. I think Lincoln and Jefferson were the two most expensive. Jefferson was not in the program, Lincoln was. But Lincoln was a small school in a very congested area. On the other hand, I understand some of your new buildings on an adjusted area are some of the lowest costs that have been built. We feel that, uh, we felt that uh, the quality of the buildings and the quality of the design might mean that they would be useful school buildings probably one generation longer than would be the case if uh, they were either less well built or less well planned. Any of the architects that I've talked to after a building experience in Columbus is very high in praise of their contact with the teachers, administrators, and the board, and the creative thinking that they've received there. I think the result of that is that these buildings are going to last as useful schools a great many years longer than if the same quality of work hadn't gone in. I felt very fortunate in being able to work in the board over the last three years and learn more about education here in our school district. I think we're all aware of uh, some of the hassles that have gone on, on in the school board elections and uh, some of the issues. I think, uh, I think one of the most basic uh, uh, questions that we all have to ask is what should education be doing these days? What should our philosophy of education be? And we can probably each state it in very general terms and be safe, but when we try to get specific, it gives us a great deal of trouble. 
And then we were all concerned uh, back a year ago when the Ford Foundation itself uh, issued some findings that really called into question some of the newer concepts in education in this country and some of the newer concepts that uh, our corporations fit in. What I'm trying to say is, I think we, uh, to know really what we need in a school building here, we need to look even deeper than we've ever looked before to know what should education be doing in this day and age. And uh, when we get as good a handle on that question as we can, then we need to approach the problem, you know, how do we do these things that we need to be doing? And what I'm asking, what I'd like to see, I think the school board needs help in even more basic areas than designing an excellent building at Taylorsville. I wonder if you would have some ideas or suggestions or be willing to work with us in, in getting answers to these. Well, we certainly would, and I believe on several occasions we either help to fund either curriculum studies or other uh, uh, investigations or analyses which the board and the administration has wanted to do. And uh, I think you are quite right that we're in a period in which effective education is being constantly redefined. Uh, of course, I'm not a professional. The only thing, the only claims I could make is to, is to be that uh, I watch, uh, we use a lot of people who've gone to Columbus schools and others, and you watch them. And if you had to, if I had to uh, step <coughs> two desirable results of education, I, uh, I, I have stated them in my own terms and not in terms of the professional. One of them is that I would like to see boys and girls come out who really thought well of themselves and had confidence in themselves. And second, boys and girls who had had an exciting experience of learning and who wanted to keep on learning all the rest of their lives. And then third, boys and girls who had a real concern for the people around them, and especially people who might not be as favored as they were. Now, education can produce that. Then a person goes on educating himself or herself all his life. It isn't just in the first eighth grade or through high school. That is just sort of the launching pad. And uh, if that launching experience gives a person self-confidence and uh, a taste for learning, then he or she is going to be not only a happy individual, but a very effective citizen in the society. And in the long run, I'm not so concerned about secretarial skills or speed of typing or whether you can run a machine tool or not. The real thing that counts to us as an employer is what kind of character have and how much fun they have living and uh, how uh, uh, and how great their commitment is both to the company and their community. And it's in those terms that I think we're going to have to judge whether education is good or bad. And uh, I see many cases where there are tragic casualties in education. <coughs> Round up in the system. Um, uh, or they come out with false values, or they have a really unhappy learning experience. And therefore, they uh, uh, either stop growing or stop learning. And I think that this uh, system has clearly put together some very outstanding teachers. Uh, all of my kids have gone through uh, all of grade school and um, a good deal of the high school, and so did I. And I would say that the school system clearly is getting steadily better. And uh, uh, it certainly is a great deal better than it was when I went to school, by a, by a large quantity. But uh, I know that's hard to hold on to. It's easy to lose ground, and it's very hard to get it back. But as an employer, we aren't looking for skills. We're looking for mature, uh, well-adjusted, uh, happy, productive human beings because we can give them specific skills. And uh, we're not looking for 
I mean, if, if this public school system could accomplish that, I, I, I just don't see how it could be. Now, Mr. Miller, you're saying that you would uh, prefer to have happy, well-adjusted people than to have people that are trained in a... No, you can train them. If they are confident, good learners, why, you can always train them. They'll absorb training right away. But a, but a person who has lost confidence in himself, no matter how many words a minute he can type, is a, is, is just a, he's a limited, ineffective employee. The big problem in a business is to get people who can identify with the whole business, understand its purpose, and work for the accomplishment of the whole, not merely themselves. And this is more important than skills. You've got to have skills, too. But uh, any such person who has personal self-confidence, concern for others, and likes to learn, can pick up skills in a very short period of time. It's really, I heard the other day, it's amazing how rapidly a graduate of Columbus High School can become an effective machine operator at company. Very short space of time. And probably this relates to his learning experience quite apart from shop, or in addition to shop. And we have the feeling that uh, products of the Columbus school system are somewhat better than the, than the products of surrounding school systems. And I think that's uh, been accomplished pretty much in the last 20 or 25 years. I, I'm not so sure that the difference would have been uh, as great, say, 30, 40 years ago. I think when I went to school, yes, the, we weren't all that different from Seymour and Shelbyville. No, Seymour is good in those days. Are there any questions? I appreciate the chance to talk with you, and uh, we'll be glad to respond uh, on Taylorsville if you'd like us to, and if you would tell us specifically what you have in mind, and then we'll talk to the people that select the panel and see if they think that uh, uh, outstanding architects would be interested, and if they, if they are one, we'll be glad to make the program available. We will have a report, Mr. Miller, from the committee in the near future, and then when we find, you know, what their report you is. You come to us, we'll somewhere. be glad to go to work. Fine. Fine. Appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A response, but we're, if we're successful in helping people that we think are going to do the job, you'll be began to see that the, that the overall quality of the Congress of the United States or state legislature or whatever is improved simply because of the, the larger numbers of people coming in. Um, we don't have any agenda of things that we think they should be dealing with. Uh, we're just saying that um, we know that uh, if you put a good man in that spot, um, he'll be reelected because the people will know. Mm -hmm. and do you, do you have any agenda of things that they shouldn't be dealing with? I mean, uh, so, I mean sometimes people can be very, a little bit too reform-minded. Are well, there some areas that you feel that, that these individuals that you would back would stay away from? Uh, no, not really. I think that uh, we are obviously uh, very concerned about the economy. And we're hoping that uh, the Congress of the United States uh, will deal with that rather immediately and perhaps rather drastically. Uh, so we're, we were looking for people that uh, perhaps didn't have their mind made up, but that had some idea and some understanding of what the issues were, because it seems to us that that's very, uh, very basic and very fundamental. And if, if our economy fails, all the rest fails. And mm -hmm. So we were, we were conscious of that, but we didn't have strong views that, that either way that they should stay away from the economy or they should stay away from wage price controls or uh, should be going one way or the other. We, All right, what about, uh, should they stay away from major increases in corporate taxes? Uh, I, we really didn't get into that, and uh, I doubt seriously that we ever will with them. Uh, we'll, we'll say that uh, we've helped elect uh, quality, competent people who we trust that will 
get down there and when the facts are before them, uh, we'll make the right decisions. And we are not so uh, presumptive to think that we have many of the answers, but uh, mm -hmm. if you can get the right people, they'll come up with the uh, right solution. So if one solution at this point in time were to say, uh, increase corporate taxes to the point where it might even be, um, oh, I suppose, harmful to the corporations. Do, I mean, do you think these individuals would feel reluctant to do that since they received corporate funds? Uh, they really didn't receive corporate funds mm -hmm. as such. They received funds, uh, in fact, that's a violation of law, but they received funds from a, a member of a corporation, an individual. Um, and I would guess that uh, what you what you earn by a contribution is at least if you have an idea you're likely to get a hearing mm -hmm. um, but I doubt that very seriously uh, that uh, in deliberations about whether to raise corporate taxes or not that a five hundred dollar contribution would have very much influence and that's uh, going to be that, uh, that, uh, that great it seems like power. a great deal of money but right. uh, I think in the amount of money that you have to spend for campaigns is so great that uh, what well, you've been around this process for a long time what do you think could be the largest uh, source of, they say the power corrupts, mm -hmm. and, uh, and many people believe that. What would you say would, would be the largest source of corruption in political figures? What corrupts them as individuals? Well, uh, I guess sort of, uh, use the word power, I think what's happened, and perhaps Watergate is a classic example of the flagrant abuse of power, that sometimes uh, it seems that the laws were, ma were made to to accommodate the office holder rather than to protect uh, his constituency. And I think that uh, it, the, the carelessness and the abuses and sort of the uh, uh, self-serving, self-dealing approach, I've seen it happen time and time, time again. Um, and there again, I think we get back to the point of accountability. Um, as long as we, as we know what's happening, but but Washington, in this case, is a long ways away, and how many people know what was going on? But I think uh, if we've learned any lesson out of this, uh, the water gates of the, of the nation, that uh, we need to be a bit more concerned mm -hmm. about what's going on. And I hope that that's been the message uh, coming out. Is there a, a problem of uh, elitism, you think, in, with elected officials? Sometimes I mean, they talk about the Senate as being a very uh, restricted club number of individuals who are elected to that position. There are only a hundred of them. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that people sort of get a uh, feeling that they're, they're better than the individuals they represent? Well, I think that that um, probably in some cases that's true. Uh, uh, it's like reading your own press clippings. Uh, and you, you begin to uh, feel that you're the anointed or appointed rather than elected. And uh, I think it's a, it's a very easy thing to fall into, that somehow this system was devised uh, so that I could uh, hold this position rather than serve in this position. And uh, I think it's a, it's a pitfall that uh, obviously does happen. Uh, but generally, the, the kind of people that I have met in serving in public life are um, just really quality people, and that they're very, the majority of them are very, very alert to uh, to their constituents, uh, we're you know we're very fortunate in this part of the of the state. We've got a very, in my opinion, a very responsive congressman. We've uh, we've elected some new people at the local level, and I'm sure that the kind of people we're running, we're going to have good government. And uh, I think that uh, there are they're the the kind of people I'm trying to mm -hmm. to to. Uh, yeah, use what, what I hear you saying here is perhaps that that maybe some people have a sort of stereotyped image of a political figure that isn't quite accurate, that isn't quite fair, that in there are opinion. a number of good people, hardworking people, who are trying to do things and solve problems and, and you know, who respect the, their constituency. Um, but at the same time, then, there's the, another group of powerful individuals who, who don't respect it. Um, is there a division between, say, the legislative body and, and something like an executive branch, where you have a, a number of appointed officials who aren't directly responsible to the uh, a voter. Well, I think <clears throat> the more uh, responsible that you are, uh, the more accountable you are if you have to run, that seems to me to be uh, the best test and the best way in which to control it. Uh, appointed officials, in many instances, uh, don't have to account, but I think the check and the balance is still that 
if a governor appoints a particular cabinet member or a member of his administration, the administration is held accountable for the actions of that uh, particular cabinet member. And the people still have an opportunity to say yes or no when the governor himself comes up for re-election. Mm -hmm. And that seems a rather diffused way in which to, to uh, get at it. But I think, uh, I think the system works. I think it has its problems. I think that there are people uh, serving in, uh, in public life that shouldn't be in public life, uh, go ranging from the kind of people that uh, on Adam Clayton Powell uh, to what we've now seen in Watergate. And, uh, but I think they are the exception. But I hope that we are more vigilant and the American people recognize that there's a great deal at stake. And mm -hmm. these, these spots are, whether they be in the legislature or um, in Washington, are extremely important. Can we go back just a moment to the cam campaign contributions? How much uh, money are we talking about? Their total amount uh, mm -hmm. that the Miller family gave <clears throat> this year to, uh, to groups, uh, some generally bipartisan groups that are working in public policy matters, and to candidates all across the country in some 66 races, about $116,000. Um, the largest uh, single contribution was a, a $3,000 gift from Mr. Miller and a $3,000 contribution from his sister to a uh, United States Senate candidate in Iowa, John Culver, who was elected. And there was a case of where, uh, in our opinion, clearly the, the best man, and uh, we felt we knew a little more about that race. But generally, the contributions ranged in the range from $500 to $1,000 in some 66 races. Are these campaigns sought? These contributions, I mean, I'm sorry, these contributions sought? Uh, generally, they are. Uh, because of the, 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 the Irwin Miller's uh, exposure in uh, world events and so forth, that uh, I guess he's on everyone's mailing list. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our job is, uh, in this case, we, we looked at all 435 congressional races. And we looked at all of the Senate races were up, and we looked at most of the governors that were running and a great deal of mail and information and so forth, and we had to send people to find out what some of these races were. And the job was sort of sorting out, and with the amount of money that was available to do this kind of thing was to find the best place for it and try to respond uh, to those that seemed to us to be most deserving. And so that's Would you favor a system whereby all campaigns are financed by through tax monies and all candidates are given the same amount? Um, <clears throat> no, I wouldn't, Don. I, um, I think that, uh, the, that the system works best when people feel that they have a commitment and are really involved. I think uh, funds to, and a good many of my friends disagree with my position on this, but I, I think that government funds or tax money, it seems to me, to give, give an equal amount, uh, give an edge to an incumbent simply because he's there and he has the, the free mail that he, the franking purpose for privilege that he has. And, and if you give equal amounts of money, chances are you're going to sort of cement the incumbent. Um, and it generally takes more money to get the message across for a challenger. Mm -hmm. To overcome, to overcome the, the, the edge of the incumbent. Right. So it seems to me that, although I do think that uh, perhaps maybe another way to get at it would be to uh, limit the length of time that we campaign in this country, mm -hmm. which I think would have the effect of, of reducing the size of the, of the pot that's needed to, to campaign. Um, plus, I think we really need to strengthen the disclosure laws of where the money comes from and how it was spent. And I think if we do those things, uh, I have a feeling that, that, that's, that that's going to be what's, what's needed. Um, I really hesitate to see government uh, get into the... Take over every, you know, that, that aspect right. as well. It seems to me we have a bureaucracy now, and I'm not sure right. that I want to add to it. I was going to say that if, you, if the, the monies were always there, then there would probably be a large business built around campaigns, and people, be, I'm sure there is, already is. Um, at least uh, to a certain extent. Um, do you find that m most or a lot of candidates have volunteer organizations, or do they turn a lot to professional candidates?
Well, um, some of the most successful ones this time had a volunteer organization. Uh, the governor, the new governor of Maine, ran as an independent against both parties. Uh, I think his total amount of expenditures were $1,500. And he had a crew, a large volunteer organization that simply went door to door. And, uh, you know, it's really, uh -huh. uh, I think it, it restores my faith in the electorate because they are willing to get in there and, and, and do the job. Again, it goes, it goes back to the point where you have an investment in that, in that commit, process. Yeah. But someone like George McGovern spent over a million dollars in, in South Dakota. South Dakota. Uh, I think that... Uh, Maybe because he had it, but you know, I'm sorry. I think that that's, I'm sure that that probably the money was there for a George McGovern, but I think that uh, the heavy reliance on large amounts of money seems to me to at least inhibit, if not prohibit, uh, a number of people running for public office. Uh, you either have to have money or you have to be able to get money. And for those uh, few that won without it this time, it, it, sh it they demonstrated that they had a, uh, a very well-organized campaign, mm -hmm. volunteers. I think that's what's, uh, you know, if I, I guess if we didn't have to spend so much money, uh, it's, it would seem.